Good morning. I'd like to talk with you about a subject that has come up more recently as, uh, as the whole concept of direct sampling receivers and SDRs have started to take on popularity. A lot of the uh, people who have been more familiar with uh, superheterodyne receivers, which have been around since 1918, is when they were invented, and they're still around. There's been a lot of concern about A to D overload in these kind of receivers, and so I'd like to give you a, a little bit of information that can help you. Um, oh, sorry, let me get this attached differently here. Uh, there's a myth. You know, like a Greek myth that's been sent around that these A to, D, uh, a to D's will overload. Uh, near, uh, superheterodyne receivers have used uh, crystal filters called roofing filters in the IF in order to prevent overload of all the analog circuitry and the uh, DSP circuitry that are in these superheterodyne receivers. And uh, what, what we've heard from people that are promoting the continuation of these superheterodyne receivers uh, in the midst of uh, SDRs starting to take over, uh, there's fear and uncertainty and doubt that's been being spread. And uh, they are saying if you don't have all this filtering, the signals will add up in the front end of your receiver and overload the A to D converter, and that's a catastrophic event. It'll totally destroy the operation of the receiver. And so I, w I set out to uh, put some mathematics behind it and actually uh, show mathematically what would happen in the front end of a receiver as you put more and more signals into the receiver. So uh, the theory is, is if you have all these receivers, if you have a wideband receiver, let's say we're receiving simultaneously from DC to 70 megahertz to pick a range, uh, that every signal coming into that radio will add on top of itself. In other words, the, all the power levels add up to where you have some huge value in the receiver. This is what many people perceive would happen. In fact, this is a direct quote that was written on one of the uh, email reflectors. I'll read it to you. The evangelists for direct sampling SDRs can do all the hand waving they want. The facts are that multiple signals will add to a level that causes clipping in the ADC. It only takes a half dozen, this is the theory, half dozen or so S9 plus 40 signals when the uh, direct sampling SDR has a maximum preamplification enabled for best weak signal reception, or it only takes one neighbor a half a mile away with a one and a half kilowatt signal anywhere on the same band to reduce the direct sampling SDR to a mass of clicks and pops. That's the theory that's being put out. So let's look at reality. Let's, uh, what, what we're starting with is let's take two zero dBm signals and we add those to, together in a combiner. What do we get? Well, we get a 3 dB increase in average power and a 6 dB PEP increase, right? So uh, let's look at what happens when we add those signals together uh, in the real world with more signals. What I decided to do was to take an Excel spreadsheet and create what I call a vector sum peak voltage calculator. Uh, an A to D converter is a voltage measurement device. It's not a power measurement device. It measures the, uh, the voltage coming into the A to D converter at a, at a very high sampling rate. And in the case of my simulation, I'm using 245.76, 245.76 mega samples per second. That's the simulation that I'm using here. And if you'll notice over on the left-hand side, it says sample time. I, I only have a portion of the spreadsheet here. Uh, each one of those is one sample in time where we're measuring the voltage on the A to D converter. <clears throat> and this is a 16-bit converter. And uh, what I'm doing is across the columns, I have different stations. Each of those represents a different on-the-air station. My particular spreadsheet has up to 100 stations that I can simulate, and I can input a power level in dBm, and uh, the phase is random. Stations on the air do not have coherent phase or amplitude. 
So I'm, I'm using simulation random number generators to gem generate different power levels and uh, phase. So that's the simulator. Well, let's see what does my A to D uh, see if I have two tones coming in that are of equal amplitude but not coherent phase. Well, it looks like uh, the uh, two-tone waveform, if you've ever seen uh, the modulation env envelope on a two-tone signal on a, an oscilloscope, it will go to zero and then it'll go to six dB higher than the individual uh, carriers are. So you, go f you see it, it will destructively combine and, and go through zero and then they'll add together and they'll be six dB higher, which is two times the voltage. So that's a two-tone signal. So what if only uh, one signal on, is on 20 meters and another is on 10 meters? What does that look like? Well, these are, once again, equal level tones, and you can see the, the characteristics of the signal change. Sometimes they're adding, sometimes they're subtracting, but a very different way. What if one signal is minus 20 dBm and we drop the other one to minus 22? You can see a different waveform. Now let's look at minus 20 and minus 24. You can see the, uh, the interference is even less. Minus 20 and uh, 24, 26, 30. Now you can see at 10 dB down, there is no addition at all. You can very, uh, see very little change in the overall waveform. So the minus 20 signal is dominant. The other signal has very little effect on it. So at minus 10 dB, below the other one, we're almost irrelevant to the signal. So now let's take one that's minus 23 and let's add 11 signals that are minus 33 dBm. Are these going to add on top of one another, like the, the theory would say? Well, what, did, what does that look like to you? What, somebody, what does that look like? Noise. noise, right. It looks like noise, exactly. Now let's take one signal at minus 23, that's S9, 50, 50 dB over S9, and then we're going to take 99 signals that are 40 over S9. These are very big signals. How many of you would ever see that many signals that are 40 over? I rarely see a 40 over signal on a, on a real S meter. Now you can take some S meters and they'll lie to you, but a real S meter. That's what it looks like. It looks even more like noise, doesn't it? Now let's take 100, 140 over S9 signals, and it looks very much like Gaussian noise, doesn't it? They're random in phase. They are equal in amplitude, equal in amplitude, but random in phase, which is the, what you would expect in the real world. So now uh, I'm going to add some information to the, the screen that you didn't have before. You'll notice the horizontal lines. There's a blue line at the top and one at the bottom. This represents the overload point of the A to D converter with a 20 dB preamp on. So this is how you would use it on the high bands, not on the low bands. You would use this on probably 15 meters and up. This would be the way you'd use it. And you can see I have 100 signals that are 40 over S9, and they're not overloading. Well, let's say, and I, I've run this simulator many, many times and never saw an overload. You can run it over and over again. You see there's one peak, a uh, negative peak, that is several dB away, a few dB away uh, from the overload. Let's say it actually did overload. What would happen? You would never know it because the sampling rate is 245 mega samples per second. The transition time at which it overloads is so small that you would never even know it would happen. Now that assumes that you properly designed your si digital signal chain. You can improperly design a signal chain and it, it will become destructive. Uh, I've actually, uh, last week, I put a plus 20 dBm signal on the carrier, uh, on the uh, inside the receiver bandwidth, and had a perfect copy on a plus 20 dBm signal, no distortion whatsoever on 20 meters. That means it's truly overloading the receiver at that point with a plus 20 dBm signal, but it didn't distort. Now let's turn the preamp off, which is the way you would operate it 
on the low bands, and you can see we're well away from overload on the A to D converter. So to take this a step further, I read a good article in uh, the National Contest Journal, in NCJ, by G3RZP, where in 2007 he had measured on 40 meters, uh, which would probably be worst case conditions for large signals in Europe. Uh, and I understand the, uh, there are fewer broadcast stations today than there were in 2007. There certainly are in America. Uh, and so he measured over a 24-hour period the so largest signal strengths that he could find. And what I did was I, I took the, the largest 20 signals on 40 meters, and there in this spreadsheet, I plugged each one of those in with a constant carrier but random phase. And what, uh, what we see up here, you'll actually see the simulation. That's the largest excursions that I could get on 40 meters, which says that uh, what's going on is random signals may add or subtract because the phase is different. They may add or subtract. The more signals that we have, the closer we get to Gaussian noise, which is as, sh as I showed you earlier. Overload, if it occurs, will be very brief relative to the sampling rate and ins inconsequential in a properly designed receiver. Random phase, frequency, and power do not add up to one huge number. Mathematically, they don't, and they don't in the real world because we don't actually see those kinds of overloads. Now, that, once again, it is possible to improperly design a receiver and have one that overloads, and there are some that do that. There are some on the market that, that will overload catastrophically. So overload from a large number of signals is truly a myth. Now, let's look at the real world. This is a uh, multi-two contest station, K9CT is well known in the contest world. And here uh, we have, uh, in a multi-two, you have You'll see on the left are two operators, and on the right are two operators. The two on the left are on one band, and then an another band over here. So you have one person that is calling CQ on a band. The other person is searching and pouncing on the same band with real time. They're listening at the same time on a different antenna. And this is pretty much a, one of the hardest environments to operate in because they're on the same band. You have two people on one band, two people on the other band. Now let's look at a 1.5 kW signal in that station received on another one of those transceivers. What mode is that? Look at the, what mode is it? RTTY. RTTY. That is RTTY. You can see the two carriers. You can see that the signal is, uh, the, each division is 20 dBm, so it's minus 30. That's a 1.5 kilowatt station listening simultaneously on site. And it's minus 30. Now, he does have good design of his antenna system. You, you wouldn't do this on a small city lot. But he does have good antennas. But this is typical of a high power multi-multi station. And you, you can see there's no overload. Um, Phase noise usually is more important in those stations, and harmonics are more important in those stations. Now, this is actually from last night, or, or yesterday, field day in the U.S. is going on this weekend. And this is a station in Arizona. I picked it up off of our internal communications. And they have six Flex 6000s operating in field day environment. They will put three stations on one band. They'll put CW, PSK31, and sideband, all operating on the same band. And there's a, I don't remember what the limit is. I think it's 500 feet or is the maximum space, if I remember right, you can be in. And they're operating all, with all digital receivers in one band. And I've seen videos of their operation. This, they've been doing this for three years now. And uh, they, they're operating without interference on three stations on one band. So I believe that the myth has been busted, that, that you're not going to add all these signals up in the way some people say that they can add up. So I hope that's shed a little bit of light on the, the A to D myth. Um, and uh, it's all about having fun in ham radio. So thank you. Any questions? <laughs>
Do I have time for a question or? Thank you, Gerald. Yeah, is, are there any questions? Okay. Um, so thanks for the great talk. Um, so so you, you mentioned that, that in this situation that um, uh, harmonics are usually the dominant thing and that's, that's actually what I would expect it too because like 16 bit that's large dynamic range. So um, uh, the point is that in a direct uh, conversion, uh, direct sampling system, you only have the one amplifier basically, and it has to be before you uh, can do any filtering. So, any power reaching that amplifier will actually lead it nearer to saturation. So that that's where I would have expected that things go wrong. Um, however powers do add up, so we get closer to that saturation point in the receiving amplifier, is that, is that right? Okay, so your question I think is powers do add up. What you have to understand that, that this is really voltage, not power that's hitting the converter. For the amplifier, oh, for the amplifier. For the amplifier it's not only voltages, right? Well, it's still the same thing because what you're doing is the voltage uh, from one signal may be negative while the other one is positive on the input to the amplifier. Yeah, yeah. So, so central limiting room says we're reaching the Gaussian case or we're approaching the, the case of a Gaussian variable, but that means that the power is, to, is, is proportional to the variance of the Gaussian noise. So um, we're actually um, approaching a case where we randomly have a a, uh, a large voltage spike, which means that we are, for that moment, intermodulating um, with with the strongest station usually. Um, so, so the question is, in in a system like yours, um, how much linear range in the amplifier do you need? Because that's, I, I think, the analog part is the hard one here. If I think that's it. true for both analog radios and digital radios. If you're talking about a preamplifier. The, the performance of that preamplifier will have an, this exact same effect on an analog radio and a digital radio. So you need probably plus 50 dBm output IP3 to have a really great radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's the usual argument to go with superhead, right? You can get, get, do a lesser gain on the input, then have a IF, filter that very sharply, get, away, uh, get rid of all the interferers, and just amplify whatever you want to do. And then you can amplify a minus 90 dB right. uh, uh, um, weaker signal, right? Well, the, the charts that I showed would look exactly the same on the front end of a, of the, this really doesn't, it's not just the A to D, that's on the antenna port. What you're seeing is the antenna port voltage. So the RMS is going to, if you had an infinite number of signals, the RMS will go to well, RMS voltage will approach zero, right? Is that right? I think that's the right way to look at it. The, the, yeah. the theory of large numbers. It's now I'm not an expert in the theory. I'm a I'm a tactician. In other words, I took a spreadsheet and proved to myself how the numbers actually add and subtract. So I'm not a mathematician to talk about central limit theorem and so forth, but. Uh, I do want to say, here's one other por important point. If you have a real spectrum display and put it on a great antenna, you don't see signals like people are, are talking about. You don't get hundreds and hundreds of 40 over S9 signals. You'll rarely see a 40 over S9 signal. In fact, I have a screenshot, I wish I'd have brought it here, from uh, Silicon Valley in the U.S., the, the, Silicon, uh, the uh, San Francisco Bay Area has a very large number of AM broadcasts, medium wave broadcast stations. And I have a picture on a 160 meter uh, antenna in that area, and the radio is wide open without overload. That's your worst case scenario. So uh, the, the point is, we don't see signals that are that big, and if you do, they tend to add and subtract sub uh, destructively. I hope that's been a little bit of help. So, so the takeaway is the hard part nowadays is the analog side because digitally we're good, basically. We're good. Right. Here. And even if you have an overload, it's very short. That I wish I had the recording. I put plus 20 dBm with no distortion on the carrier. Yeah, I mean, constantly overloading, constantly clipping has some... Spe we we yeah. can actually calculate the spectrum of that and right. that leads to... But the thing is the, the real world doesn't have that. Yeah. That's, that's for the other point.
Okay. I'm not prepared now, but I did some measurements uh, with my red pitaya. Uh, I'm just opening my document on that, uh, but I think it's a little bit time to prepare it. But I can uh, find out that uh, we have a lot of signals here in Europe on the antennas, and they are very high, sometimes minus 20 dBm. And uh, there are a lot of signals in the area between 10 megahertz and uh, 14 megahertz. It consists of the radio bands from uh, maybe 30 uh, meters to uh, 25 meters. And this is very important on the European signals and the people who w uh, were experimenting with uh, direct sampling converters, they think of special pre-selectors just to reduce the signals from outside of the ra uh, radio ham bands. So your experiments and your uh, talk was very interesting to me as well. And, uh, I would like to say it is better that uh, I should have be prepared for it. <laughs> okay, is there anybody inside who can assist us with uh, giving us a short USB cable? On one side, USB A uh, plug, and on the other side, a micro USB. Mini, mini USB, mini USB. Anybody who has a cable. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Keep it. Don't run away. Uh, Marcus is just out. <laughs> we have to unload our camera. The camera has now 39 minutes still, and uh, we have to unload it. He tries to, to get a cable on the flea market. Hopefully, he will be back, and then we could <laughs> edit. Okay, thank you very much, Jared. Thank you. Okay.